Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. Um, if you're having any trouble hearing, uh, you probably aren't hearing me at all then, but if you are having trouble or the, the audio is not very good, um, if you go to the audio tab on the right-hand side of your screen, ensure that your speaker is selected. It's the second drop-down, and make sure the correct speaker is selected so that you can hear properly. Uh, everybody's going to be muted because of the uh, large size of the audience today, um, so you'll be able to submit questions, and I'll go, go through that shortly here. But um, my name is Abe Gardner, and I'm the EMG product manager for Cadwell Laboratories. And I want to thank you all for joining us for this uh, next series in our education and isolation webinar series. The topic today is single fiber EMG, and it's presented by Professor Meredith Eric Stahlberg of Uppsala, Sweden. In the early 1960s, Eric developed single fiber EMG along with Dr. Jan Eksted. Since then, he's impl implemented the method for the clinical routine. It is the most sensitive method to detect a uh, disturbed neuromuscular junction failure and has its place in the diagnosis of myasthenic conditions. Today, he will talk on the use of concentric needle electrode recordings of jitter. Over the last 30 years, Professor Stahlberg has also developed methods of quantitation of the conventional EMG, the so-called multi-MUP analysis, and analysis of interference pattern. He has also invented EMG methods such as macro EMG and scanning EMG for the National Neurophysiology Service and for the international co collaboration, he was early to implement the use of telemedicine. This webinar will consist of both a lecture as well as a clinical demonstration. Uh, we'll have a brief question and answer section after the lecture and then a second question and answer session after the clinical demonstration. Um, any questions that we aren't able to get to, we will try to get um, a written response and, and email out a writ written response to those questions. You can submit questions in the toolbar on the right-hand side of the screen at any time during the lecture or clinical demonstration, and we'll get to those during the breaks. We have a large audience, but we will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. I want to thank Eric for helping us with the webinar and now turn the time over to him. Abe, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. And hello, everyone that is listening this uh, wonderful Saturday. In Europe, we have very hot weather right now and many people are already on vacation. You see, I'm sitting among the trees. Today, we're going, as Abe was saying, uh, a little about uh, the jitter uh, recording with concentric needle electrode. Uh, I hope that the information today, both the lecture and the video, uh, will give you, first of all, an update of what you already know, but also some new things that we have tried to put in. So, uh, have fun. Thank you. In this video, we are going to discuss the use of concentric needle electrode for the recording of the jitter. But first, a few words about the classical uh, single fiber EMG and uh, some of its principles. Here is the uh, recording area of a concentric needle electrode. And there were many fibers here to be recorded. And that was not a good idea to obtain just the activity from one muscle fiber. And therefore, a needle uh, electrode was constructed with a much smaller recording surface. And the uh, selectivity was further increased by changing the amplifier filters so that the signal components of low frequencies, namely those generated from more remote fibers, were um, restricted so that all signal components below 500 hertz were um, suppressed. Now we get uh, sharp signals with amplitudes from uh, a few hundred microvolts up to, to many millivolts could be recorded depending on the position of the electrode in the muscle. Here is the principle of the jitter recording. This is one axon that divides into two branches and connects to motor end plates. The uh, electrode is inserted in the muscle in such a way that activity from two muscle fibers from the same motor unit can be recorded. And here is the recording and there is a 
delay between the, the two signals depending on the position of the emote REM plates and the individual conduction velocity of the muscle fibers. So at consecutive discharges this looks quite nice and constant but when superimposing the sweep after triggering on the first one we could see that the time between the two varies a little and that time variability is due to a time delay or a variable time at the uh, neuromuscular junction of the order of uh, 10 to 30 uh, microseconds and this is the normal variability the normal jitter in situations of disturbed neuromuscular transmission such as myasthenia gravis we could obtain uh, the following set of recordings in a given muscle in one position we get the nice double spike with the variability of the order of 20 microseconds maybe we trigger on the first in another position of the muscle we get a larger uh, variability, a larger jitter, and in the uh, third position we see it even larger jitter and now also intermittent uh, impulse blockings. This gives rise to fatigue and it also gives the uh, decrementing response on repeti repetitive nerve stimulation, but this is the heart of the technique that we can detect disturbed neuromuscular transmission before we have any blocking. That means a subclinical detection of abnormality. Now, in order to quantitate this, we need to measure time between the first and the second pulse. And the original method was to have time windows with a starting uh, point here and then uh, the, as a stop like a stopwatch we stop the measurement when the signal passed through this window so between this and this and next time between this and Nick and so on uh, this was uh, the uh, technique that is used in some equipment still another uh, possibility was to measure between the peaks between this peak and this peak and for a signal like this it gave exactly the same jitter value but in a situation like this where the signals are riding on each other not uncommonly seen in concentric needle electrode recordings we start the uh, measurements here and if we now use the original amplitude level technique we measure actually on different parts of the signal this signal is measured in its middle and this part was measured somewhere uh, closer to the positive peak whereas if we use the, the peak measurements we measure here 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 independent more or less of the the uh, phenomenon of riding so uh, what i'm going to show here today is mainly the peak uh, uh, triggering method that is implemented in a few uh, EMG equipment. Here is uh, one example of a display where we have the amplitude trigger level. We start here, we stop here and measure the jitter. The uh, hit of the second signal is indicated by dots here. So this is time during the recording and this is uh, the the time between the two pulses and the jitter is seen as the blurring part here when we instead use the other uh, technique of peak trigger we have the first signal here and the second here and the variability is seen in superimposition here and the peaks are indicated by dots so this is the triggering peak and this is the variable um, peak and variation here is called the jitter and in this case it is 45 microseconds.
because of restrictions of only using disposable material, we also had to look at other alternatives to the uh, single fiber electrode and found that concentric needle electrode of the smallest kind, namely those that we call facial needle, can be used. Here are um, the comparison between different electrodes, monopolar, the concentric needle electrode, the regular type and the facial type and the single fiber. And here is the size of the recording surface and you see how much smaller the single fiber is, but uh, uh, this one facial is also much smaller than the conventional concentric electrode and certainly much, much less than the uh, monopolar. So we have chosen the concentric facial needle to be um, used for uh, GT measurements. Here is um, a schematic drawing of how many muscle fibers we can have across the electrode when we indicate the uh, positional fibers as we uh, see it statistically. It's usually about 200 micron between two muscle fibers in a normal motor unit. So many fibers are over the concentric electrode, fewer over the concentric facial, and just one fiber over the uh, single fiber electrode. Now, we, uh, with this uh, facial needle, we uh, ins in insert the needle uh, in a, sli a slightly slanted direction uh, through the skin uh, into the muscle. We hold the needle like a pen. We don't make any special uh, rotation, but we can uh, optimize the position by minimal movements in and out. And uh, we ask for a very slight uh, co uh, contraction. That is usually one of the problems we have when not being able to record good signals. That is that the patient is activating too much. So slight uh, contraction. Uh, and then we obtain signals and we do not start the collection of data until we have a good signal. We wait a few seconds until uh, the, the signals are good and then we start the collection. That means that we don't need to edit much uh, afterwards. We go for 100 discharges and with the frequency of uh, 10 per second, uh, we have obtained the, all the recordings in 10 seconds. And usually we record from 20 different positions in the uh, muscle. And that includes uh, usually two skin insertions. The amplifier setting is uh, one kilohertz. In the single fiber, we had 500 hertz, but now we have one kilohertz to 10 uh, kilohertz. And here are some uh, typical recordings. This is um, uh, the triggering part and this is the, the jittering part. And uh, our uh, rule is that the uh, rising face of the signal should be without notches and shoulders and the signal should be uh, uh, exposed in a, a parallel uh, shape. They, they uh, should not show any special variations here. This is uh, a riding signal, but it is good. This shows not uh, a parallel rising face, so we skip this one, but uh, we can use this one. We start here and record on this one. We trigger here and you see that this is uh, not parallel rising phases, so they should be omitted. This is a, a single fiber electrode. And you see that the signals were rising with a parallel uh, shape and uh, they were constant in shape but variable in latency. And here is a recording with a concentric needle electrode.
And here is another concentric needle electrode recording. Here is uh, another equipment uh, to just show the same thing again. We trigger here and here we have the variation of the uh, second potential uh, and here they are shown in raster mode. Here is a situation where we trigger on the second one and we see the large jitter here. This is increased, this is abnormal. We have a very slight variation in the peak which we accept but no notches or anything special uh, here. Similar thing we trigger here, we have the variability here in the first one and we have an, uh, another motor unit activity uh, that is uh, occurring on the sweep but not disturbing the recording. Um, another good good recording with parallel signals. We ha have here the triggering spike and one peak here, one peak here and one over here. This one is slow and low and we omit this because of, of certain definitions of amplitude but we can measure the jitter between the first and the second and the first and the third uh, and the jitter values here are within normal uh, limits. Here is another situation where we trigger here we have some fluctuation in the baseline and uh, here the riding is very severe so the first peak of, of signal uh, number three one two three the, here is the earliest number three and here is the latest number three and we have a range here of uh, about 200 microseconds and that corresponds to a jitter of about 100 so that is uh, definitely abnormal but it's very difficult to measure this uh, uh, variability but you can see with the eye the variability. Here is uh, a standard display of the f uh, uh, during the recording that you will see a little later. We trigger the signal uh, on a, a given highest amplitude and we obtain this. In this case it, we triggered on number two and we got the jitter on number one and uh, here is the same thing in uh, superimposed mode and here is the dot plot where we have the triggering signal here as the yellow and the variability here with another color and the jitter is 83 here and the summated uh, result. Here we have another signal with trigger on the uh, first one and see the variability here but here is obviously uh, a summation of activity from two muscle fibers and uh, you see that this inflection point here is uh, about half the signal amplitude or below the 50% uh, level and then we can accept it. Had it been up here somewhere we should have skipped this recording but this one is acceptable. Here we have a situation where we trigger on the first and we see uh, more, more, more spike components one two three and we see that first second third and then at one occasion in this recording uh, blocking was indicated that means that there was a missing uh, signal and that was this occasion where the variability of this one is within this range and the peaks should all fall within but if there is a definite deviation from the statistical uh, most common latency then the computer uh, says that this must be some, uh, mi uh, some missing of that signal if it is not within this uh, limit. In this case it was not the blocking, it was simply that um, uh, this signal was superimposed by also another signal so it is a summation here and it fell outside the, the limits for recording. Here this is uh, seen the same thing. 
here is a more complex situation where we have one two three spikes and that it, this this filter effects and uh, the computer is measuring between the first and the highest value of these two they are so close so the software thinks it's just a one fiber but it measures on the highest amplitude so you see here so on the third spike third second third second and so on uh, and this gives a dual distribution of the green dots uh, over here and it indicates a very high jitter of 91 microsecond but uh, it's obviously a disturbance this is not correct so normally I should have skipped that but just for the sake of demonstration we can restrict the acceptance limit here by changing this uh, box and we uh, restrict it so that the, the uh, um, trigger from the third peak disappears and now we have only from between the first and the second peak and the jitter went down to 27. The display of the jitter is uh, by raster, but it's also very good to use um, 5 or up to 15 for, for to look at, at the, the distribution. Sometimes uh, <coughs> the latency continuously changes uh, and there, therefore the superimposition of all uh, peaks is not a good idea. Here is the, the distribution of, of uh, 100 discharges and uh, that is uh, for statistical reasons wider but if it had been a shift in the latency it should have been even larger. So we superimpose between 5 and 15 spikes. Here is uh, just a, a regular situation in a patient with myasthenia where we trigger on the first and see the jitter on the second peak and sometimes we also see impulse blocking so large jitter and impulse blocking here we are triggering on the uh, first peak and we can measure p uh, between 1 and 2, 1 and 3, 1 and 4 and if the jitter now happens to be very large in the first one then all the others will uh, suffer from that. So here we're triggering on the first and we get a large jitter to all of the others, 67, 62, 58. But this was not optimal. We, we uh, re-trigger and now we are triggering on the third uh, peak. Here is seen. And now the jitter between uh, 3 and 1 is 62 but between 3 and 4 is uh, 3 and 2 is 35 and uh, 3 and 4 is, is 33 uh, we can uh, look at the uh, display down here when i switch from the first to the next uh, recording and you see that th that this has much lower uh, total jitter we call it j sum in this case the software is automatically in the post-processing finding the best reference uh, peak from where the triggering should be made independent on how we did it during the recording and re reports the jitter from this situation. The muscle fiber can be activated either, either voluntarily as I have shown here but also with electrical stimulation where here is the muscle and we are now going to do intramuscular stimulation with a monopolar needle as cathode and a surface electrode as anode. We insert this in the muscle and have a very slight uh, stimulation strength uh, a few milliamps and with the frequency of 5 to 10 hertz and we insert the needle into the twitching part and record a stimulus artifact and single fiber uh, responses. Normally the, the jitter then is uh, seen indicating that we are stimulating a nerve and that this comes from the neuromuscular junction. 
if we are stimulating directly on the muscle fiber, there is no jitter, which means less than five microseconds. So we can tell uh, if if we have uh, stimulated uh, one or the other, and certainly it's this one that we want to measure. We can also use the surface electrode for stimulation, where in this case to the uh, facial branch to the frontalis muscle, and we uh, record from frontalis. There is a problem with the electrical stimulation, namely at uh, borderline stimulation, we get uh, both long latency and signal jitter and blocking uh, that, that takes uh, place in the point of stimulation. And therefore we increase the stimulus just a little uh, from maybe three milliamp to four milliamp and then it becomes all of a sudden more stable and does not uh, uh, de decrease in jitter more with increasing stimulus. If we increase it a little more because we are uncertain about if it is supraliminal or not, then a new muscle fiber is coming in because we stimulated a neighboring nerve twig and that comes in with an increased jitter so we cannot use that for measurements so we increase the stimulus strength a little and when we get that uh, stable then all of a sudden another comes in initially with increased jitter and therefore stimulation looks very easy that you can get many spikes right away for recording but we cannot trust that we we must check that all the individual spikes uh, that we want to measure sh should have uh, a supra maximal stimulation that means does not change in jitter with increasing uh, stimulus so this is little time consuming and um, uh, from, from just a picture you cannot tell if a, if a jitter was real or, or artifactual. Here's a situation where we stimulate with minimum stimulation, we get two spikes from the same motor unit and then we increase the stimulus just a little uh, and you uh, axon is stimulated and then we have three spikes and then we increase the stimulus a little more and then we get four spikes but this is subliminal stimulation you see that we have something that looks like blocking but this is in a normal muscle and uh, with increasing stimulus this one should have become uh, stable but we we uh, did not do that we just uh, measured to this three with electric stimulation we measure the jitter between the stimulus artifact and each individual peak. The practical thing is that we uh, uh, stimulate with a frequency of 5 to 10 hertz and we use a slight uh, stimulus of short duration usually 0.05 uh, and we um, ma make sure that the spike of interest is supraliminally stimulated as I just uh, said. And here we will see some examples of this uh, uh, situation. This is uh, in raster mode and superimposed. This is uh, in raster mode and you see the spike plot down to the right. One, two, three, four. And I wonder whether that is a single spike really. No, it is not. And you see that uh, these are not parallel lines. Here is another recording with multiple spikes, not an unusual picture. And when we superimpose, we see some that are nice, and this one is not uh, in parallel, and this has some disturbance in the peak. So we skip these two, but can measure to the others. Here's the same thing. It looks very nice, but when we look at the details, we see that both of them actually or have a summation pattern. This is the recording from a patient with myasthenia that one motor M plate here was normal and then this one is uh, abnormal. And here you see the same patient with jittering signal here I can superimpose and you see 
and also we see that uh, there is uh, uh, missing impulses here. This can be due to insufficient stimulation, but we checked that by increasing the stimulus a little, and the second never came back. So it's not technical, it is biology, it is due to myasthenic blocking. Here is a situation where the second one shows a little uh, inflection above 50% of the amplitude. So we have one jitter here and another jitter should be here. These uh, recordings are omitted. We just move the electrode a little so that one of the fibers is uh, dominating. And this is a good recording. And here is a, a special situation where we have obviously summation of different fibers and although the the measured jitter is only 13 that means normal uh, it is uh, not uh, acceptable this is not a clean single spike in a multi-center studies some years ago from uh, uh, europe america japan south america we uh, developed reference values for um, muscle from orbicularis oculi, voluntarily stimulated, frontalis, voluntarily stimulated, and extensor digitorum, voluntarily stimulated. And this is the jitter for individual recordings, and this is the mean when we have measured uh, 20 recordings. And in comparison between the original single fiber uh, recordings, we found that the single fiber and the concentric jitter is very similar in the sensitivity to myasthenia. So actually we, we can uh, safely use concentric jitter for the diagnosis. As uh, shown before, the single fiber is very sensitive to detect disturbances. In ocular we, f we f find uh, abnormality 97% of the uh, recording, if we record from two muscles, generalized myasthenia 99%. And even in ocular myasthenia, we find abnormality in 60% of the recordings because ocular is defined from the clinical uh, situation. Uh, repetitive nerve stimulation about 50%, and the antibodies 55 and 80%. Now, something that we always uh, point to is that the increased jitter or abnormally decrementing response for that matter is not equal to myasthenia gravis, but it is a sign of disturbed neuromuscular transmission. And theoretically, we see that in electrolyte disturbances and certainly uh, in our daily practice, we see that in early re innervation also. So, uh, it is very specific to disturb neuromuscular transmission, but it is not specific to myasthenia gravis. And here is a summary of um, the uh, signals to be accepted. They should have a positive negative inflection without notches or shoulders. That means that they should have a parallel rising segment. The negative peaks should be separated. Uh, for, for accurate measurements, and a slight amplitude variation is uh, acceptable. And here is the, the setting of the amplifier, the filters we already mentioned, the sweep speed, 0.5 millisecond is a good sweep speed that allowed detection of small uh, changes that we really are looking at. The gain, we make the signal to cover about two divisions in the, uh, on the screen. And we superimpose uh, 5 to 15. We have some uh, special situations here that we sometimes think that, that a blocking is uh, shown, uh, but the jitter is normal, and that is uh, theoretically not possible. So what is that? Well, that is when we have another signal, not a double potential pair, but a 
single signal that is triggering because it has a high amplitude and therefore starting the sweep. This signal is not the same as this one. You can see that it has a different shape. This one is broader than this one. And it's due to the following that we trigger here and both the double potential and the single uh, reach an amplitude above the triggering and therefore initiates the, 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 uh, the, the sweep. So uh, this is not uh, blocking. We have uh, often questions uh, of this kind. Can we measure fiber density with concentric needle electrode? No, fiber density is defined from the very small surface in the single fiber. So here we have to trust the, the motor unit potential parameters, amplitude, duration, and so on to tell whether it is an abnormal distribution of muscle fibers like in, in re-innovation or myopathy. Which muscle do you use for the uh, diagnosis of myasthenia? Well, one should go for symptomatic muscle. If we have a weak muscle or a fatigable muscle um, with normal jitter, that is not myasthenia. If we have weakness, then it must be uh, impulse blocking, not only jitter, but also blocking. And if uh, the, the, uh, the jitter is normal, then it's not uh, myasthenia. But otherwise, we often go to, to um, facial muscles, orbicularis oculi and frontalis, and they are equally sensitive to the abnormality. We have to remember that uh, the uh, previous injection of Botox can be seen as increased jitter also in remote muscles. Uh, and that can remain for quite a long time, three, six months and even longer. So if you have a patient uh, and get an unexpected high jitter, um, you have to ask the patient whether he or she had uh, got some um, injection of Botox within the last uh, year. And if the jitter is normal in orbicularis oculi with ptosis, what is the interpretation? Well, ptosis is weakness. So if that is due to myasthenia, the jitter must be increased. If it is normal, consider alternate uh, diagnosis. You can uh, read more about this on some links. We have a special uh, homepage for single fiber information uh, where we have uh, a number of videos and uh, other information about upcoming meeting and so on that you can go in and look at. This is the end of the theoretical discussion about uh, jitter analysis with concentric needle electrode. Thank you for listening. So we are ready for uh, some questions. Uh, uh, only a few minutes. I think that most of the the questions that you ask now uh, will be answered in in the following. Uh, a demonstration, live demonstration. But let, let's see if we have some questions uh, at this moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stefan here, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, is, ha, does temperature have an impact on the single fiber recording or results? Yes, it has. Um, in general, uh, and that is very typical for decrement, a, a cold uh, muscle it gives an, a more safe transmission and warm muscle gives uh, more abnormality. Um, and uh, therefore, particularly if you do the decrement, we have to make sure that we are not uh, working with a uh, too cold muscle. It is nearly never any problem to have too warm muscle, only too cold. Okay. Uh, how many trials do I have to do to, for, a, for a recording in a muscle? We usually take uh, um, two skin insertions. We make a total of uh, 20 recordings, and each recording contains um, 
ideally 100 discharges, but we accept down to 50 discharges. But if you have less, uh, then the uh, values are not so reliable. So uh, try uh, not to start the data collection until you have a safe and good uh, position of the electrode. Then it's a matter of few seconds to collect all the data you need. Okay. Uh, if the values are quite different, uh, shall I use the mean value or the individual values? Uh, we use um, both. These are uh, the, the abnormality in the muscle is very patchy. So some outer place may be very abnormal, others may be absolutely normal. And, and therefore, we introduced the, the uh, technique of using outliers. If we have a few motor uh, end plates that are definitely outside the, the limit, then we call it abnormal. Uh, and sometimes all motor end plates are just slightly abnormal, and then the mean value can be used. We have uh, uh, normal values for both mean and for outliers, and we find that uh, for different patients, the, the two techniques are equally good. In, none of the techniques is, is better than the other. Okay. Uh, what are the common errors doing single fiber analysis? Uh, the uh, most common problem is uh, that we have too strong activation from the patient. We should uh, really have a, a very slight activation, so only a few motor unit potentials are, are active. And then we should make really small movements of the electrode to optimize the, the position. And that is for voluntary. For electrical stimulation, the greatest problem is subliminal stimulation for a given site. You know, for a given position of the stimulator, some axons are uh, activated uh, supraliminal, others are just about to be stimulated. So erroneously, we can think that, that we have uh, blocking and so on, uh, just because of bad stimulation. That is a big, uh, big uh, artifact. Okay. Uh, if we have a patient with di diplopia, is it common to find positive findings in frontalis? Um, diplopia is uh, for sure a, a sign of, of muscle weakness. And if that is due to uh, myasthenia, uh, then usually also frontalis shows an abnormality. And we have the, the routine that we test uh, orbicularis oculi, and if that is normal, then we also take frontalis. If the first muscle is uh, um, abnormal, we don't need to take the other muscle. So first one muscle, frontalis or orbicularis, then the other one of the two, and then there is no need to go to a third one. If the two are normal, uh, then we do not gain anything extra by uh, checking other muscles. Okay. I think uh, the last question for this uh, section session now is, um, uh, uh, what would it look like if the needle was between fibers from different motor units? Yes. <clears throat> um, let me just, uh, uh, go, go back again. We we want to insert the needle so that we are between two fibers from the same motor unit. That means that they are time locked, more or less exactly, except for the jitter. So that is what we are striving for. But if we happen to record from different motor units, then the signals are completely uh, asynchronous. They are not related to each other. So if we trigger on one of them, the other is not seen as a, as a potential pair. Okay. Uh, I think maybe we should stop there for now and continue with the demo and then continue with some more questions after that. Okay, fine. Okay. Let's see if Abe is starting the video. Ah, you turn your camera. In this short video, I'd like to show the practical aspects of recording jitter with the concentric needle electrode. In the recording of frontalis muscle, I uh, sit behind the patient to get a good overview. And we are going to uh, 
investigate the left frontalis. I ask for a slight uh, voluntary contraction and insert the needle like this. And we obtain a signal uh, like this. And we can uh, trigger on the highest peak here to get the stable, nice signal and we can uh, move the delay. We can also trigger on the first signal the smaller one there, but that will also introduce other, other signals. So in order to get the clean signal, I trigger on the highest. And we see the jitter to the right. And a good trick is to superimpose the recordings during uh, uh, the uh, collection of data. Then we see the jitter much better. But when we are going to look at individual traces, then we uh, separate them in raster mode. I usually use uh, uh, 10 or 15. In this case, it is a 10. We superimpose 10 and 10, and we have raster 10 and 10. Then we stop here and we read the jitter. That is 14.9 uh, microseconds. We insert the needle uh, at another position in the muscle. Ask the patient for a slight voluntary contraction. And here is a triple potential coming. It has relatively high recruitment threshold. There are other motor units that are active in the background. But now we have uh, about 75 discharges and we can stop and get the, uh, the jitter there. With uh, automatic trigger on the second potential and a jitter of 19.5 and uh, 31.8. And we get another position in the muscle with uh, uh, many components, but three are uh, dominating here. And we get uh, many signals right away. We are triggering on the first one. And we see the jitter on number two and number three, and we can stop here. Here we can, if we wish, change the trigger to the second one or the third one. But um, this was the, the best. We move the needle again, and here we get a, a signal with a very high innovation rate. It's, it's going, and now we have more than 100 discharges and this is a jitter. There is an inflection point here at a, a low part of the signal so this can still be accepted and if I superimpose you see as a good trigger and this part the main part of the signal shows parallel lines here so uh, this is quite okay. I move the needle and here we get a, a good recording we have now about uh, 100 discharges and can stop the recording. This big one was a disturbance, but you see the, uh, the nice recordings uh, are here and the jitter is 10.7. Then I'm going to show the electric stimulation. I, I move the stimulator a little. I asked the patient to help me write for this demo. And here you see that, that the lower part of the frontalis muscle is moving. Here, here we have here we have nice contractions uh, right here, and it's too much. And then I decrease the stimulus. We uh, now have a seven six milliamp. And then guided by the position of the uh, testing uh, stimulator, I now fix uh, a permanent stimulator. It can be either a monopolar and a surface electrode, it can be a bar electrode, or like in this case, uh, stick on electrodes. I uh, increase the, the stimulus until I can see a twitching part of the muscle again. And and here we, 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 we see a twitching part here in the uh, and I, I insert the needle into the uh, twitching uh, 
part and, and start to, to record. Here, here are a few spikes. And when I have uh, very little stimulation, they come and go together. So these uh, two come from the same uh, axon. And you can see to the right here that they move, uh, move together. So it's a jitter from uh, both of them. And here uh, I increase the stimulus just a little and we get uh, more, more spikes and even one more is coming in. Now we have uh, three spikes. One is not fulfilling criteria, but we are measuring for the two others. And then I increase the stimulus a little and see whether this large one is becoming more constant. Yes, it did. Here it became more constant. Uh, and here you see that uh, re uh, recording uh, situation. Then I increase the stimulus just a little and uh, more fibers are coming in. You see uh, the, the uh, last ones there. I reduce the, the stimulus just a little and you see these two spikes come and go together. So they are um, belonging to the same axon. Then I, I increase the stimulus a little. I can change the, the sweep speed to, to, to show individual spikes. I increase the stimulus just a little and they become more active, but uh, we did not uh, get more uh, fibers here. Here we get a very large uh, complex of signals, too much of stimulation. I increase the sweep speed a little to see better. This is uh, just uh, a large number of axons. So I, I uh, change the stimulus strength and here you see two of the components come and go together. Can you see? These two big ones come and go together. I decrease the stimulus strength. I decrease it more and more. For measurements, I, I could say that we want to have uh, uh, just few, few spikes. I reduce the, the stimulus. One is showing something that looks blocking, but now we measure between uh, a few different uh, spikes indicated with the uh, markers there. If I increase the stimulus, I'm sure that new spikes are coming in. Yes, and then I reduce the, the stimulus. Here we can measure jitter. And you see how they all move uh, together a little because it's uh, jitter at the stimulation uh, site. I increase the, the uh, strength a little to make them all more stable. And here they are all very stable. I increase it even more and now they are, are uh, stable. And now we are going to uh, do a recording from the frontalis muscle in a patient with myasthenia gravis. Here you see a nice single fiber recordings. When we superimpose, they are in parallel rising phase here. So this is a good recording and uh, the jitter is nicely seen to the right. It amounts to 102 microseconds. At this situation it is just about to become uh, with blocking but we don't but we don't see any blocking in this particular recording. Here is another recording in this case with a larger jitter, it's around 200 and it shows uh, frequent blocking. 
it is easily seen here but it can also be seen on the superimposition where you see a line through the uh, recording here want to see the, the frequency of the blocking we can uh, browse through the the whole uh, whole recording uh, in this way and this blocking is not due to false trigger because the first signal here is absolutely constant in in shape so it's the second potential that is really um, missing here's another recording with a large jitter a trigger on number two and we see the uh, jittering signal but there are no blocks you see no line through it here and when we inspect the, the the signals we don't see any blocking uh, at all in this uh, case the jitter is uh, 85 microseconds here is uh, a recording with a high firing rate and the jitter is, is quite uh, large and you see uh, the behavior and you see the behavior here the jitter is uh, about 100 microseconds here is multiple recording with uh, complex uh, uh, signals and we trigger on the uh, second one and when I stop it keeps the second we could have triggered on the first one but then the Samaiti jitter is much larger and uh, therefore we, we go over and trigger on the uh, second one. This jitter is 87 and 19 and 36. So in the same motor unit you can have different uh, abnormalities among the motor and place. And now we are recording from the brachioradialis muscle. Uh, with a slight voluntary contraction triggering on the second signal here's something we call flip-flop and you see the jitter uh, there and then I move the needle again here's another the last one is not a pure signal so we cannot use this that was a, a combined summated signal. I move the needle and we see an early small component. Here's a good recording. And now we have 100. Uh, we, we stop recording and I try to find a new position. Here's another. The trigger is a little too low, so I increase, I lift it up a little. Now we get more stable situation. And you see the jitter in. in. Now I, I moved the electrode a little. So the second one is the biggest. And here we get the good recording um, and then we can superimpose uh, f uh, 15 and you see uh, the, the jitter display there okay the complex signal and here we have a, a few components that look very nice and that is enough we got 100 there so I think that is uh, enough for this muscle um, that uh, it is a little more complex than um, the frontalis and it's uh, definitely not as complex as EDC or even worse the uh, tibialis uh, anterior muscle. This is the recording from the extensor digitorum and I search needle and you see we find a, a signal there the first one is a little irregular and I move the needle to, to get a, a good first component stop and 
and then I move to another position and here we have one other component that is very low in amplitude and I move the needle and we can get it up and we are now recording on a good signal stop we move to another position component is not interfering with the first peak so this can be uh, used for, for measurements and also we have a late component that is not uh, the violet one that we do not uh, accept this is a recording from the tibialis anterior muscle in a patient with a history of L5 radiculopathy some years ago it will probably show neurogenic changes and this is a demo then of the, the neurogenic jitter that we will uh, see. Here the last component is, is jittering. can see the superimposition uh, at the bottom of, of all 100 and here is the superimposition of only 15 at a time and we can move that uh, through through the collected uh, area of signals This uh, signal, the beginning there, it's not possible to, to measure. They're very close uh, together. You see the increased jitter, but I don't use it. There's one late component coming in. I move the... Uh, change the delay a little and you see the late component there is blocking This was the end of the practical demonstration of the use of concentric needle electrode for GT measurements. It's important that we collect high quality data uh, for analysis and do not rely on post-processing editing. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, can't hear you. So I'm here now. Okay, great. We have a couple of uh, uh, questions for, for, for a few minutes here. Uh, um, there are EMG machines that measure the jitter horizontally and not on the peaks. Which method is more reliable? <clears throat> uh, I try to show that when the signals are completely separated, the two techniques show the same result when the second potential is riding on on the first one um, then the uh, horizontal measurement 
will uh, measure on different parts of the signal and that gives an error. So then the peak detection is better. So in general, I prefer the peak detection and that is available in, in different equipment nowadays. It's a more modern technique. What are the differences between different lengths of single fiber needles? Uh, the length. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that the important thing is the uh, size of the recording surface. Doesn't matter how long the cannula is. Uh, can we depend on a discharge of less than 200 microvolt in amplitude? Uh, we, uh, you know, the action potentials have an amplitude from zero. That means when they are very far away until they can give an amplitude of 10, 15 millivolt. We have simply made a cutoff of 200 microvolt in order to stress ourselves to get really good signals. A good sharp 50 microvolt signal can also be used, but then the rise time should be short, which is usually is not. So therefore, it's just an optional a number that we have said 200. Okay. Uh, what are the differences between MG and LEMS with stimulation jitter? <clears throat> MMC, MC, Mystenia. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, 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 Lambert eater. L Lambert eater. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Sorry. Um, the uh, if we if we did really uh, very careful um, recordings, we could see that with increasing frequency, both voluntary and electrically, the uh, Lambert Eaton jitter will decrease with increasing um, innovation rate with fi with in the, uh, firing rate. Uh, in myasthenia, it's the other way around. Usually we do not uh, do that type of test. We do the following. We see a large jitter uh, in both situations and then we test with the um, uh, uh, decrement, uh, I mean repetitive nerve stimulation, and there you see the difference very, very clearly. Uh, the effect of, of uh, uh, activation is so different. So, so we diagnose the difference on decrement when we see the jitter very clearly with single fiber. Does stimulated single fiber EMG yield more consistent quality results than voluntary single fiber EMG? Uh, I should say the other way around. Voluntary is little more, maybe people think it is more time consuming and maybe people think it's more difficult. It looks so easy when you have electric stimulation and see many spikes. And I did not stress that during the video uh, that you measure between the stimulus artifact and each of these spikes. So many times we got uh, five or six recordings in, in the demo here. So it looks so be so quick, but the, the problem is that we are not sure about the supraliminal stimulation. We have to sit and, and turn the knob all the time. So um, I sh should say in general, when you start this, it looks like, oh, we have to go for stimulation. But in the long run, the voluntary is safer, less artifacts. Okay. Uh, are a normal values age dependent? Uh, yes, a little, uh, and um, uh, particularly in uh, in distal muscles, but uh, it, it is not so much. Um, but but we we have made uh, made different uh, tables for different uh, ages. Which muscle would you recommend to analyze for myasthenic syndromes in babies? You said the, for Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome? Uh, just myasthenic syndromes. Yeah. Um, um, Babies. My, what, what is the last word you said? Uh, uh, which muscle would you recommend to analyze for myasthenic syndromes in babies? In small children, babies. Oh, no, in babies. Oh, okay. In babies, well, I I, I think uh, myasthenic syndrome, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, the uh, 
the easiest is to make repetitive nerve stimulation and there you can use uh, uh, distal uh, muscles, hand muscles, foot muscles. For myasthenia you have to go for proximal muscle but the question was uh, babies, babies and Lambert Eaton, any muscle, um, particularly uh, easy with the dis distal hand muscles. Uh, for the single fiber uh, you can use um, uh, the, uh, the forearm muscle, extensor digitorum uh, muscle and electric stimulation. Okay. When should we depend on MSD? Is it, is it still practical with concentric needle EMG? It's a very uh, uh, useful and it's practical. Um, we don't have time to go into the differences. They are a little different in, in mathematics, but modern software measures both. And the software chooses the best of them for each recording. So sometimes it's a MCD, sometimes it's MSD. The software has chosen that. Uh, can we increase the yield for diagnosis if we repeat the SFENG if first test is normal and still clinically suspected? Yes, absolutely. This is actually a very good strategy. You have a patient with suspicion of myasthenia, you do the weak muscle or at least the uh, facial muscle, frontalis and orbicularis oculi, the two. In, and if these are normal, repeat the study after three months. And you know, there is no risk of waiting for the diagnosis if the symptoms are so slight that you don't even see it on single fiber. Yes, it increased the yield with rep repeated study. Okay, thank you. I think that's uh, it. There are some more questions, but I think that will be answered uh, by writing. Uh, yeah, I think time is running out. Okay, we're going to collect the, re the remaining questions and uh, I will try to answer them to the best of my, my uh, ability uh, later and it, the answers will be sent out to you. Thank you very much for listening uh, and uh, good luck with single fiber EMG. Thank you very much, Eric. <clears throat> and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we will keep, stay posted. We will be um, uh, advertising more webinars and uh, this web webinar was recorded and you'll be receiving a link to that recording within a day or two. So, so watch your email for a link to the recording of this webinar. And thanks again for joining. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Stefan.